Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back for the second Design at Large seminar. And uh, kind of by schedule and coincidence, but I'm really happy about it. Uh, we get to meet two of my mentors in the first two weeks of the seminar. So last week we had Sebastian Thrun, and this week we have Wendy Chu. And I first uh, really got to know Wendy. I've known her for a very long time. Uh, but I first really got to know Wendy when I arrived at Stanford and was teaching uh, my first studio course in the context of uh, an engineering school. And this is something that Wendy had a fair amount of experience with. And so she and Bill Verplank and I uh, offered this interaction design studio course, which was super fun, and, and we've all gone on and, and taught a bunch of stuff since then. But Wendy was my guide to Stanford when I arrived, especially in terms of how do you do studio teaching there? And um, Wendy is maybe more than anybody else I, I met at Stanford, somebody who has figured out how to leverage the different exciting things about the different parts of the university. And so this is a really interdisciplinary audience here. Uh, Wendy has taught and done research uh, not only with me and others in computer science. Uh, she worked with Karma, the Center for Research on Musical Acoustics and has taught in the music department there, building novel musical instruments. Uh, she currently is the executive director of the Center for Design Research in the mechanical engineering department. Uh, she was one of the people who helped make the D-School become what it is today. She founded a design magazine, Ambidextrous. I have all of the back issues in my office that you can uh, peruse through. And um, she's really figured out how to pull people together and through her energy and excitement about what she's working on. A, a number of great projects have emerged from that. And she's going to share some of those with us today. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Um, so I'm just going to take a quick commercial break at the beginning. <laughs> um, Bill Verplank and I are uh, the chairs for the Tangible Embedded Embodied Interaction Conference, which is taking place in Stanford um, in January. I know that this is a crowd that will really appreciate that conference, and though you don't need to come to Stanford for the good weather, you might want to come for, <laughs> um, for the interaction. It's a wonderful conference. It's international. Um, the paper's deadline is passed, but there is still the Student Design Challenge, Works in Progress, Art Track, and Student Volunteers. Um, so I, I really think that, that the crowd here at ECS would be perfect for that. So I, um, advise you to go to the actual the conference website I should have put up here is tei-conf.org. Um, but also on Google, I think you can just type TEI15. Um, so the topic of my, the title of my talk is Creating Connections. And when I picked that as a title, I think it was because I was thinking the main theme of the stuff that I'm doing right now is about engagement with interactive devices, between people and interactive devices. Um, we're entering this era where we're surrounded by like, more and more devices, environments, vehicles that support us and assist us. But always interaction with these things is a little bit off. And I think by doing research on how people interact in public spaces and interact with other people, we can gain insight about how to design these things better. Um, one of the things I liked about this idea of creating connections and then why I picked this picture of connectors is that I think there's a feeling, like the snap of a connector, like good uh, retaining uh, clip, that happens when things are designed well, that we need to learn to recognize and also value when it's there. Um, I think we all actually have some recognition in that feeling, and that's something that, as a research community, we haven't really valued. We actually do things where we ask people to have variables you know, and, and do the experiments, and I think that's important. I think that figuring out which variable is important to query is actually something that we don't train people to do. And especially in this environment when, we, when you guys um, are concerned about design and you know about all the many variables you have to take into account when you're designing and think about how to reduce that down to the things that matter, I think this is, an, um, this is an audience I really want to talk to about that feeling and how as a research community we can actually uh, chase good design. Um, I'm going to be covering five projects in human-robot interaction. And these are projects I worked on not by myself, by a long shot, but with colleagues and students. Um, they actually take big teams of people with really, really different backgrounds to pull off. So I, I don't want you to feel like I'm, I'm claiming this work for myself. Uh, one thing I want to do before I launch into any of the projects is to situate this um, as design thinking research. And so I have a lot of text. 
But this is one of my favorite quotes. I'm actually going to read the whole thing to you, and then we'll talk about it. Um, this comes from Bill Mogridge, and he um, relayed this in an interview that we had for Ambidextrous Magazine. He says, design, by definition, is mostly tacit knowledge. It has to do with people's intuitions and harnessing the subconscious part of the mind rather than just the conscious. If you think about the structure of the mind, there just seems to be a small amount that is above the water, equivalent to an iceberg, which is the explicit part. If you can find a way to harness towards a productive outcome, the rest of it, the subconscious understanding, the tacit knowledge, the behavior, just doing it in the intuition, all of those, then you can bring in the rest of the iceberg, and that is hugely valuable. And so um, part of the problem with trying to design things that act right and that feel right is that the part of our brain that just knows how things should behave is different than the part of the brain that knows how to articulate and think about it explicitly. And so what we need to do as researchers is to think about how we can actually make a translation process from that deeper understanding to a more explicit understanding that we can share with others and discuss and reason and run controlled experiments on. Um, and I think this is especially true as we move into t new territory, um, things where we have interactive objects, autonomous cars, robots. We don't have conventions of design to fall back on. We can't just say, like, well, this is how it's done. People know how a chair works. We'll just design the chair the way a chair is supposed to be designed as it is read by people. Um, so we need to come up with principles and methods that allow us to leverage tacit understandings in a way that makes sense with multidisciplinary teams. Um, and then I, I don't have time to do a lot of prior research, but there, there is a lot of um, pre-existing research looking at mo movement as communication, which is a huge inspiration. Um, actually, I can't believe David Kirsch is sitting in the audience. You know, <laughs> A lot of his work on embodied cognition is definitely you will see uh, running throughout this work. But we as people basically have a really deep in, uh, intuition for understanding movement as communication. It's been vital to our being able to interact with one another. And this is so ingrained that even something like a point light display on a human body walking um, is enough to co convey a lot of information to people. Like people who are looking just these, at these points of light moving around can read things about the activity people are engaged in, the gender of the people involved, you know, the relative confidence or mood of the people involved. That is pretty amazing. Um, and it, so it's often this kind of movement and not necessarily the form of an object that actually leads to the snap of recognition, especially when we're talking about activities. Um, so this, this um, actually carries over to things that are not necessarily anthropomorphic. Um, this is a picture of something that's an experiment from Heider and Semmel. Um, in this experiment, they actually had um, a few shapes interacting with a box, so, um, two triangles in a circle. And when they asked people to describe what was going on, only one subject out of 34 described the film in geometric terms. And every other person used language that like, used people to describe the shapes moving around. And 19 of the subjects used a narrative, like you know, a man planned to meet a girl, this sort of thing. So I don't think that people think that the triangle is a man, or they mistake the circle as a girl. But this is the way that we make sense of the world. This is, these are the uh, tools that we use to understand language and action. And so that is really important for us as designers and engineers and researchers to know and work with as a material. Um, final point of, of inspiration, I'd like to point, uh, look at Luxo Jr. This is this uh, Pixar movie of a lamp. Um, and the way that that lamp moves is so wonderful. I think everyone, you know, yes, it's a lovely movie, has a wonderful arc, but from the very first moment when it pops on the screen, it's just this, you know, like thrill of recognition. And I think that's that, that feeling that we need to actually chase. John Lasseter had this thing to say about how he got that motion. And this is just the fact he was able to nail this down is amazing. He said, all of the movements and actions of a character are the results of its thought process. These are drawn figures on a screen, right? Or there's a computer model. OK. All the movements and the actions of a character are the results of its thought process. In creating a thinking character, the animator gives life to the character by connecting its actions with the thought process. So I, obviously, this is metaphorical. We all know that the, the machine model doesn't have an AI. But it means that when we are looking at a lamp, we expect to see certain things happen before action happens. And if we do, don't see those things, we don't understand what happens, even though the action is right there. Um, and so we have, this is the only one thing which I have this direct connection with. Um, 
um, I, I was doing some work at Willow Garage, working with their PR2 personal robot. And all the time, the robot was doing things that we didn't understand. And when I say we, I don't mean we visiting researchers coming from Stanford. I'm saying like we, people who work with robots every day and are programming it all the time. The robots were just completely inexplicable. This is, a, um, I'm gonna show you, this is what the robot does when it's trying to open a door. This is a laser scanner. Okay, what it's trying to do is build up a really nice 3D model of the door and figure out what the door handle is to reach for it. People who program computers, people who do research on depth field maps, all the time feel that, find themselves reaching in to move the door handle for the robot because they're just trying to be helpful. And in doing that, they make it so the robot has to go and profile the door again. <laughs> this is the people who are programming the robot, right? So this is like a really deep-seated feeling that we have. Um, And this is the way that the robot opens the door. So this PR2 is actually doing something akin to thinking. I mean, it's at least doing very, very deep um, perception and modeling. And when it has successfully opened the door, it does actually have a model of that. But when you look at it as a person, it is the most inexplicable thing. It does not look like it's trying to open a door. It doesn't look like it successfully opened the door, even though the door is open. Um, and the really fun thing is we actually had the privilege of having Doug Julie, who's one of the animators that worked on um, WALL-E, the movie, um, come. And he was like, well, it's not doing the pop. It needs to do the pop of recognition that says like, oh, I see the handle. Oh, I see it failed. Oh, I see, succeeded. And the engineers were horrified. They're like, well, this pop, this vertical dimension is something that we can't do with the robot. And it doesn't roll. And he's like, you're kidding. That's like super important for expressivity. I bring this up because all the time, the kinds of research I'm going to show you, when we're doing design, we actually try to work in the lowest level of fidelity we can so that we can actually figure out what we need to build before we build it. And Often in the area of robotics, people feel like, well, you really shouldn't be able to publish robotics research until you have built a robot. And that's a chicken and egg problem because by the time you build a robot, for sure it's the wrong robot that you have built. Um, so one of the wonderful things about working with the animator is that he can help you build fake robots. Um, we actually built fake robots in an animated world that did four things. We had a robot that opens a door. We had a robot that serves a drink. Um, we had a robot that tried to get assistance with being plugged in, and another robot that ushered uh, you to a seat. These were all things that the PR2 actually does, and we actually made an animation where the robot does what it does in the real physical world. And then we did another one that actually, where we had the robots perform forethought before performing the action, and also reaction. So here are some video prototypes showing that. Oh, let's see. <laughs> and this is the reaction. Oh, let's see. I think there's supposed to be one more video. All right, well, I will tell you that when it shows a uh, reaction to failure, it basically shakes its head and it goes like this. <laughs> um, so we actually uh, took these videos and showed, uh, ran a web-based controlled study that, so we can get kind of large end feedback. And what we found was that, um, not totally surprisingly, not surprisingly at all, um, by performing forethought, people kind of it helped to ensure people's sense of sureness about what the robot was trying to do, and it also kind of uh, 
correlated with, with the rating, improved ratings of approachability and appeal for the robot. Um, this is the really interesting bit. People thought a robot that failed to open the door but recognized that it failed and looked disappointed was smarter than the robot that successfully opened the door but didn't correctly react to the success. So actual execution of the task is less important than the recognition of whether you succeeded or failed in the way that we look at machines. And if you think about that, that's kind of amazing because not one of the machines I own acknowledges when it ever fails, ever. Maybe you would think all these machines were much smarter if it just basically you know, fed back. It was disappointed in itself when, it, when I'm disappointed in it. You know. Um, so one thing that I find happens a lot and you shouldn't feel bad about is that people laugh when I present my research. They especially laugh during the videos. And I have this theory is that, that there's a comedy to that moment when you recognize the thing that, that is right. And I think that's actually that kind of that feeling I was talking about, that snap. Um, we find that all the time when we're doing these field experiments, when people see something where we'll, we'll roll the same robot out like five times and then one time we'll roll it out and people will be giggling away. And we'll know we're on to something. And so I think there is that, that really important feeling. We shouldn't, we shouldn't ignore that. That's actually a really important thing. So you know, when you feel that, that's, a, that's an important, um, that's actually something I try to train in the engineers that we have. Like That's an important moment, that recognition. Um, so the next project I'm going to tell you about is uh, about consistency in telepresence robots. And you know, this is basically on its way to happening. We basically all the time are looking at Skype, um, like pictures of your friends and laptop windows, your parents, colleagues. And one of the weird things that kind of happens is that you actually have two proxies for your remote participant. You have their actual head on the display, but then also the laptop kind of becomes the head of the person, right? Very often if there's multiple people, you're like turning that person around. And you think about it as turning that person around. You don't think, I'm turning my laptop around. So it's easy for there to be what we call a proxy and proxy problem. Like when the head of the person on the screen looks to the left, but the machine doesn't look off to the left, it's really hard to tell what they're looking at. Uh, you gotta get a little bit of a Mona Lisa effect. Um, and so one thing that we thought is it'd be really interesting if you could actually use robotic technology so you could actually help line these things up. Um, but it's not always clear exactly what the right way is to do that. Uh, I'm gonna show you some videos. So that's something where you just have the in-space motion. That's just the on-screen motion. Yeah? You feel that? That's where the giggling? Like, when the in-space motion and the on-screen motion are consistent, like that sense of like, oh, I understand exactly what's going on, and he's like looking in at me, becomes really clear. Like, this difference that might be, you don't think like, why do I feel unsure about what they're doing? Is it because maybe they're looking in onto something on their screen or looking back? You haven't really dissected the whole thing about what's right or wrong about it, but the moment you see the right thing, it just feels different. Um, so. Um, we are looking for that recognition. We never publish the recognition. We never say, we show this to a bunch of people and everyone laughed and we know we're on to something. We, run control, we try to figure out what is the thing that we have run into, you know, how can we differentiate that from something that doesn't work and how can we run controlled experiments to validate that. But a lot of times that's very, for us as, as design researchers, really anticlimactic because we're so sure. You know? <laughs> There's no mystery when we get the results back. Um, there is a little bit more mystery in this kind of thing. Let's see. So here we tested this kind of same basic food that we have, but we actually tested it in a scenario. So we had to stage a scenario and we had, we set it up as a design scenario so people are collaborating with someone who's far away. 
Um, we actually had people um, assess the different contributions of the different people in the meeting based on the video they're watching, and it was a between subject study. So um, in some cases, it was actually the remote person that was leading, and sometimes it was a local person that was leading the interaction. And sometimes there was actually uh, on-screen and in-space motion, sometimes only on-screen motion. And not surprisingly, people felt like the person who was far away that was actually moving in the space was um, contributing a lot more, you know, had a lot more influence on the, on the interaction. But maybe one of the things that we didn't expect to find that was really interesting is also people rated the people in the local meeting to be more equal and to be contributing more if the other person was physically in the space moving. And then if you think about that, that's really interesting. Like the, the fact that someone is kind of cold and not moving kind of detracts from everyone's you know, sense of performance and contribution. If it feels like you are engaging them, not only does it make you a better participant, it also makes everyone else also more involved. Um, and so that's one of those interesting things. It is worth doing these follow-up studies when you feel like something matters, still doing the study to find out why it matters can be really interesting. Um, I want to say something about um, the technology behind the video scenario prototype. Let's see if I can just watch this again. Oh, no. So this is actually a working robot. Um, it's cable driven, it's got a neck. This is a um, owie arm. The man who is operating that is sitting <coughs> here. Because <laughs> that is a good way to make sure we don't have a latency problem with the on-screen interaction. So one of the things that's really fun and interesting to do when you're experimental research is how you operationalize the study so you actually get something that's like a good result. And a lot of times that means that we're building robots that are a long ways towards a working robot, but have some features that you would never put in a working robot. Um, sometimes it means we're able to do everything with duct tape and strings. Um, and I think that that's actually, it can be really important. I think part of the thing is that when, once you have an actual robot which wasn't built to make a, video, uh, make a prototype or a scenario enactment, you basically start to buy into a bunch of um, concessions to the actual engineering that keep you from exploring the larger range of interactions. So I think it's, it's constantly an issue because roboticists would like you to test things with real robots and real algorithms. But I think for designers, maintaining that um, wider spread of, of um, possibility is very important. So when we look at the results, I mentioned this, so the um, perception of dominance involvement of the, the remote participant and the equal th equality of the local participant um, was improved when they had on-screen and in-space motion. Um, I wanted to show, because you guys are a design lab, some of the things that we were doing as we were developing um, these motions. Um, we actually start out with the IMAX G4. One thing that we find is that it can be really useful to use things that are found objects. Why invite everything from scratch? Um, this product in particular had a really amazing neck mechanism. Um, in order to push it around, we actually developed four bar linkages that we could use as puppeteering, to, for puppeteering. Um, and we set up something where we had black felt and someone just stand there and move these things around. Um, we actually did a substantial amount of testing in real world um, use. So we all the time have um, people who are away on travel, who who were phoning into meetings, um, and we actually would say like, hey, can we host you on our robot? And then we actually have someone standing back and like move their head around and turn them around. So both these people were actually involved in making this robot work because when the remote participant wanted to look this way or that, he would have to say something to David, they would say something to Eric, and Eric would push his head in the right place. But we got to, we got to feel like, oh, how does, you know, how does everyone else feel having Soren you know, call in on this meeting when he's participating this way? And that actually helped us get this intuition that, for example, like we all felt a little different when it seemed like Soren would look at us when we talked. You know? um, and that made us go and look for um, some uh, psychology studies that, had, that focused on that relational aspect. And then we do a fair amount of improv. that to the left. <laughs> Eric, what if you looked to your right? No, 
look to your left. Now look the other way, and Wendy, move the other way. Oh, we got all kinds of artifact in there. I said, that's okay, that makes it look real. <laughs> um, so that, I mean, that's something I don't normally show people, but I, I would think that, that this is actually the moment when we're really trying to make the magic happen. Like, that's the moment that, as researchers, we're really, like, feeling around. Like, what is working, what is not? You know, like, what are the dimensions that are mattering here? Um, and I think one of the things I would really like to see is that um, to see the field go to the place where these sorts of things are being shared more widely. Um, um, this third project is with emotive drawers. This is a IKEA Mickey um, drawer that we've uh, kind of used Arduino to and servo motors to um, actuate. Um, this actually, this idea came from our undergraduate researchers. They were they were playing around with. Um, we were working on this kind of improv thing, and they wanted to test out that something on something they came up with. So they actually like a, someone had a set of plastic drawers, and they were, you know, testing out different ways to interact with the drawers. If they were robotic, how would you open it? How would you close it? How would you know it was done? This is just on the other side. There's someone pushing the drawers in and out. <laughs> so that, that's followed up by a robotic Wizard of Oz prototype. One of the things that's tricky is some amount of stuff has to be directly controlled and some of the stuff has to be pre-programmed you know, in as animations. And so figuring that out and programming that in is, you know, there's a substantial amount of work that goes into figuring out the right kind of control to make a good interaction. So also amount of training that goes into being a good wizard. Like, you have to do a lot of anticipation. You have to really, really have a good feeling for what people are likely to do and what the right way is to react. Um, and then we built up a bunch of different scenarios. This, I mean, we, this we were looking, one of the things that we noticed was that it seemed like sometimes, depending on the way you open the drawers, the drawers were more happy or mad. You know, and I thought like, well, when should the drawers be happy or sad or mad? You know? Um, so we actually tested whether it mattered if the, um, drawers kind of match the emotional state of the person they are working with. Let's see if I have. So this one is user initiated matching. Okay, I clipped it before I showed some of the other ones. So um, we actually have follow-up studies for this where we actually had people um, build something, like make a box, and they actually had all the tools in the drawers, and so we were actually able to also do live study. Um, so with, with real participants, not just an actor. Uh, the participants of our online video study preferred the empathetic drawers to the neutral ones, and they disliked drawers that um, displayed emotions that were orthogonal to the user's emotions. One of the really interesting things is that um, in the, the study that we just ran, where people were kind of using it first person with the robot, um, they really felt challenged by the proactive drawers. Like when the drawers were like pushing open to suggest the next tool to move, people were kind of upset by that. And one uh, user actually used the word dominatrix to <laughs> discuss that. 
And interestingly, interestingly, when the robots were emotive, that seemed to temper their concerns about that. If the, if the drawers were kind of pushy but happy, that kind of made up for a lot of pushiness. You know, and also, if the, um, if the drawers were reactive, and, and kind of slow, but they were like more emotive. That that seemed to be, so. It seemed like it, you know that the, the the something like proactivity and reactivity can cause these really strong divergent reactions. But the appropriate emotion actually helps to fix that, which I think is just not something that your typical robotics engineer is going to spend all the time working on. So it's really interesting. Um, the following project is called Mechanical Ottoman. Um, Enough of you probably do computer science to know why I think this is funny. Um, but just in case, um, now when we talk about Mechanical Turk, we talk about artificial, artificial intelligence. We talk about crowdsourcing in the cloud, people from all over the place. The mechanical Turk originally was this um, automaton that would play chess with you. And the important thing wasn't just that it, you know, knew how to play chess. It's a machine that knows how to play chess, but that it would physically move the pieces around. And one of the really interesting things is the way that they did this, they actually had a man, tiny man, sitting inside the cabinet with a little candle with a little board, like working it out and then moving all the pieces around. Um, and I, I find this to be really interesting because we do so much puppeteering. We do a lot of Wizard of Oz. Um, and so, I, I, you know, it's not in general a good idea to found your research projects on puns. But, <laughs> but in this case, this is what we did. Um, um, so, so we thought, like, you know, I, instead of just focusing on the cloud and the crowds, let's go back to physical interaction and thinking about how to support people and using Wizard of Oz to kind of create that sense of intelligence. Um, and I should mention, I forgot to say in my introduction, that Wendy worked on and helped name my favorite research project name of all time, which is uh, at, MI, at the MIT Media Lab, she and Joe Fish K and others worked on a research project that was on the smart kitchen and the research project name was counterintelligence. <laughs> so maybe it's a good idea to found your research on puns. <laughs> um, so actually, I will mention in terms of time, I was in a workshop with David Kirsch. And David Kirsch mentioned working with dancers as a way of kind of like doing research on body cognition. That was really inspirational to us. Uh, so one of the things that we did in this research is that we uh, found an ottoman that we could uh, move around on sticks, but that we worked with I'm a stage actor, an improv artist, and a dancer, because these all seemed like people who had more intuition about different kinds of movement and what they meant than, than we had. Um, and so we, we kind of had these sessions where we had people come in and like play around with this idea of a robotic ottoman that would offer itself to your feet. Um, you can kind of see here the fishing line that's being used to kind of like prop the top. And then behind here, there's someone pushing things with sticks. Um, into the frame here. He came up with that. We're like, shoo it away, and then that's what he did. <laughs> so trying different refusals. One thing that's also fun is is having both that first person and third person's perspective. There were a lot of things that felt really right to him, and from the third person's perspective, we're like, it looks so wrong. It looks really, really, really rude. You know, and we'd show him, he's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know? um, and so, so that, that is one of the things that's been uh, interesting, looking at these different perspectives. Um, one of the things is that, even though we, I've shown you a bunch of things where we're doing enactments, a lot of the most interesting aspects of these engagements were talk. We'll see if you can actually hear what he's saying. <laughs> Should I like do this? <laughs> you want to do this? Huh? Is that the time? This? Is that rude? Do this? Yeah. <laughs> but this is not true. It's just like fuzz off. That's like, I don't care. I thought it was like fuzz off. Oh, <laughs> you can do this to the thing, but then your relationship is over. <laughs> so he said, you can do this to the thing, but the relationship is over. So one thing that, that was happening a lot in our engagements on the interactions that we were actually having a lot of discussions of uh, cultural norms of servitude. You know, like most of us didn't grow up in an environment where we have servants or anyone that would push anything at your feet. 
children. Actually, some people were like, I can't imagine I might have this relationship with my children someday, is what one person said. Um, but um, there was one point at which well, the dancer that we worked with is a woman who's, who's African American. And at one point, um, we had the Ottoman back away instead of kind of turning around and, and moving away. And it's interesting because the Ottoman doesn't have a face, you know, but we were like, let's just see if this matters. And she said, oh, now we're in India. And I was like, what do you mean by that? And she's like, oh, in India, they have this whole like celebration of, of, of service, you know, and, and, and they kind of raised it to an art form that's amazing. And people are in and out and doing things for you that you, you wouldn't believe. And it was really interesting because she is an African-American woman. And in our country, we have this, you know, issues with slavery. And so people doing for you things for you is considered to be bad. And she was like relating this to some place where people doing things for you really well is really good. It's a high art form. And so that, that, that is actually really interesting and a difficult conversation for people who come from technical backgrounds to have, but really so important. Um, what is the relationship um, in terms of social status that we have with the robot and, and how do we modulate that? Um, this one is interesting. I will say, uh, this is Joe Fish K. He's in the human computer interaction community for people who know them. He's uh, actually an improv actor. People might not know that. He has over 13 years of experience doing improv at the studio. And he is British, which is yet another kind of take on the kind of cultural sort of thing. So he's treating the Ottoman like a dog. He kept whistling. We didn't ask him to whistle. <laughs> and then he kept talking about going hunting. <laughs> Watch this. This is so dismissive. It's crazy. <laughs> So after a bit, we kind of worked on these uh, robotic Wizard of Oz prototypes. This is actually a turtle bot just sitting inside the shell of the ottoman that we had. Um, it doesn't matter that we can't tell, you can't tell, but like it's, it's really confusing. To we spent a lot of time talking about whether it mattered, that whether it had a face or not, which direction it moved. We'd actually like to try this out with the omnidirectional robot. So I actually sense that people might feel really uncomfortable in fun ways. That would be interesting. And then one of the things that it took our students a while to get this working because linear actuators that move fast are hard to work with. Um, they finally worked on, got this um, top that moved up and down going. I don't, they're speaking Cantonese. I don't know what they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys are the first people in the universe, besides us researchers, to get to see the next things. We ran naturalistic lab studies. This is actually a little moment of inspired genius. After some other study that we had people run, while they were sitting in a chair doing a questionnaire, we had an ottoman approach people <laughs> and offer itself to people's feet. Um, <laughs> And um, here are some of the videos of their reactions.
So um, after the robot was sitting underneath the feet for a couple minutes, um, we actually had the robot try to leave and break the engagement. And so we, we experimented with the taking leave too. annoyed. Last one. Okay, so um, the results so far, I mean, all the participants of the study really clearly understood that the Ottoman was trying to engage and disengage. Um, so there was no lack of clarity, you know, confusion about the intent. Obviously, none of these people have prior experience interacting with robotic Ottomans. Um, not every single person cooperated, and they had all these interesting things to say about that. Like a lot of people said, I could tell what it wanted, but it's like my dog, and I don't put my feet on my dog, so I'm not going to put my feet on this Ottoman. And other people felt totally fine doing that. The really interesting thing is that people uh, ascribe various agendas, emotions, and like a kind of really deep inner life to the Ottoman when they were kind of explaining what the robot was trying to do. Like, people were sometimes really angry when the robot tried to leave and they said something like, I guess there was someone more important somewhere else to put, <laughs> to put the, you know, themselves under, or, you know, maybe there's something else it's supposed to do. Um, and so I, I think that is, is sort of uh, interesting. I mean, in, in terms of trying to convey intent and, and, and suggest engagement. Um, one of the things that is interesting to us is that the Ottoman is something you might actually have a longer term relationship with. You could actually train yourself to work with an Ottoman. But there are a lot of situations where we're working with machines, around machines, where you don't have the opportunity for training. So that kind of instant understanding can be really important. So this very final project I'm going to show you, um, we actually had a robotic trash barrel. It is nothing more glamorous than a create robot sitting underneath a brute trash barrel driving around. Um, it did some work uh, needed to be done to make it so we could wirelessly control it and stream the video off. But I'm not claiming this is like a huge technical feat. Um, again, showing you some of the design process. This is kind of our putting around with a robotic prototype, doing improv. How would you request it to come? How would you respond? Um, and my, my students made me this video um, of their field experiments. It says, Adventures of an Adolescent Trash Barrel. <laughs> Some people are excited to meet me. 
Uh, I will say we actually did two sets of runs. Um, there was a really popular sandwich shop called Ike's on campus in the Wang Engineering Center, which had these beautiful, super smooth <laughs> floors and really good Wi-Fi coverage. And then they closed Ike's down. <laughs> so then we ran experiments in the Stanford GSB. Um, totally different crowd. Different feelings towards robots. <laughs> 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 There's that dog thing again, the whistling. This is a kid that was trying to bait the trash barrel forward by waving garbage at it. <laughs> it's kind of amazing because it means people believe the robot has an intrinsic desire to consume trash. <laughs> this is funny. People did this thing that we called interacting, where they used a lot of effort to not interact with the robot. And it wasn't because they weren't interested. Later on, the same woman, he turns around, and she's filming it. And she's like, <laughs> people are helpful when he gets into trouble. Um, so this is actually um, field studies that we just finished running at the end of summer. So um, one of the things that we've noticed in the first round through the videos is the social status of the trash barrel is different than, you know, the equivalent social status someone who is going around pushing a trash barrel would be. I, I mean, you would expect that when um, someone comes by and offers you a trash can, you give them stuff and you say thank you. But one of the things that we notice is that when the trash barrel comes by and people put trash in it, they are waiting to be thanked. If the trash barrel just moves on, they're kind of like, that's rude. <laughs> you know, they need a little wiggle that's like, I acknowledge that you gave me trash and moving on. Uh, one of the reasons for this, we think, is that people seem to, uh, the people think that the robot intrinsically is motivated to consume trash. It wants trash, it likes trash. And that's why you can do things like bait it with trash to move where you want it to move. Um, that's not something we think about people, right? We assume that people are doing it and it's a job. But the robots actually have a different motivation, which leads to different social status, which means totally different interactions. Very interesting. Um, the other thing that was interesting is we thought a lot about what is the way that people would engage with the robot? How do you start an interaction? How do you finish the interaction? We didn't spend a lot of time thinking about how not to interact. But what we found in the field was this was really important to people, that they wanted ways to kind of clearly show that this is not something that's going to happen. They would like be pushing stuff away and they'd be like very pointedly not looking at it. Um, and this ne wasn't necessarily because they weren't interested in the robot they were too terribly busy because the moment the robot turned away, they were taking pictures of it, you know. Um, so, so that is something that we didn't design and I think that was a, a big shortcoming. And we learned that um, by doing the field experiment, we learned how important that was. Um, so connecting back, we had Five different projects. We're looking at kind of animations of robots performing forethought for the actions. Uh, we're puppeting telepresence robots. We're doing video enactments with interactive drawers. Um, there's kind of improv in Wizard of Oz when we're looking at the mechanical ottoman. And we're doing field studies in Wizard of Oz with the trash bell robot. I think that one of the reasons why I'm pointing out all the techniques that we're using um, in this crowd is that these design techniques we're using are also research techniques. Uh, most of the research is um, kind of exploring the design space to understand what matters. And then once we kind of hone in on what matters, um, we can actually do these controlled studies and have these like really narrow findings, which I think are applicable, but maybe are not so, not as broadly applicable as the research techniques that we're using. So I actually think you know, that's something that we should all be trying to do. Like what is the right way to do a collaborative, you know, improv engagement? That is um, really important. Um, going forward, um, I recently started doing research in autonomous car uh, interaction. I actually have just come from a really distressing IEEE so uh, Systems Man and Cybernetics Conference on Intelligent Vehicles, um, where any number of roboticists engineers expressed the belief that most car accidents are caused by people, so getting rid of people will get rid of car accidents. <laughs> I think what would be really interesting is to take some of these design research techniques, like Wizard of Oz, 
and figure out how to put that in the simulators so we can understand how, what people have questions about, what's the right way to talk to people, what things engender trust, what things cause you to um, lose trust. And I actually don't think that we should assume. I think one thing is a lot of companies are always trying to make the best product that people like the most. But my big fear is that you'll have a system that is not totally trustworthy. It has like some limitations. And people will like it because it gets them where they're going. And it's friendly. It has a beautiful display. And it makes them look fancy. And at the moment when their life depends on taking control from the machine, they won't want to do it because they won't want to offend the machine. So I mean, I think one of these things that is really important is to think about these tools and how we can evolve them so that there is more design. And we are thinking about how to test these interactions that are happening in the future. So um, with that note, um, I'd like to thank, I to have the names of the people that collaborated with me on these projects that I just uh, worked on. It was funded by Willow Garage, the former Willow Garage, and the Hosno Potner Design Thinking Research Program. Thanks. You know, it's, it's so, so true and so powerful that people ascribe all of this intentionality, but, you know, when you talk about one of these examples, you can kind of easily come up with the opposite, too. It's kind of amazing how much people dismiss the intentionality of even other people or the service worker, you know, who comes by, right? Anyone who's worked in service has had the experience of kind of being treated like an object. <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of goes both ways, mm -hmm. you know, which is really interesting, and it seems like you know, you're talking about how do we have this switch, right, between like, you really love your car, your computer, or whatever, and sometimes you need to see it as an object. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered if you could say more about that. Yeah, well, so one thing that um, I have this PhD student, um, Dave Miller, and the thing he's going to do his PhD, a large part of his PhD thesis on is, is this thing that we're calling the trust fall for cars. So what it is is a test of how much you trust your car. It's like literally you drive up, on a simulated, you know, a simulated road, and there is a cardboard box, and then the car, car tells you it's fine. <laughs> you know, my sensors say it's fine, just drive through it. Um, what we're interested in all of, uh, is, is all the things that happen before that trust fall, and how that changes whether you drive through the, the thing or you try to drive around it. Um, and we, tried, we want this to be something which feels really real and like you're really invested in, and you make this decision really quickly. Um, so, so the question is, like, you know, what are those things? Is, is being friendly or having too nice an interface or, or giving too much or not enough information? Like, are these the things that kind of engender trust or a more realistic picture of what's going on? There are a lot of people who are trying to make all these crazy, fancy, heads-up displays where you show people a lot of information. That might or might not be a good idea, you know? It may or may not make people trust the system more. It may or may not make them respond properly. Um, one thing that I think is interesting is um, right now when we do these, when we have people interact with prototypes, a lot of times the prototypes are very literal representations of what the manufacturer would like to see as product. Um, and what we have found is a lot of the really interesting points we get come from the conversations around the objects. So even though we don't necessarily want a talking dashboard Temporarily, for the purposes of research, having a talking dashboard is a great way to find out what people are interested or thinking about or you know, concerned about. So um, this is kind of the way that we're going about it, like trying to figure out what are the tools we have to probe the question. Um, but I, I, I am, I mean, this is a completely new field for me. Um, and so I, I, in some ways, have the, the benefit of coming in without a lot of feeling like I have answers. You know, I can, I can just be interested in what the right way is to ask the questions. like cheating. I'm not saying it's a bad mm -hmm. thing. I'm saying mm -hmm. it's a really good thing, but it's sort of like what is the difference between what the puppeteer is capable of doing with the device and what the technical implementation can achieve, right? So that like, as far as intentional right. Um, yeah, so a lot of times what we do is we basically build the system to move the thing in the way that feels right, and then we basically go back and curve fit 
you know, what the action is, how fast that means you have to move, and then we try to spec a motor. So in some ways, it's almost like the, the opposite way from, from how people normally design. There is a paper I actually, um, Guy Hoffman invited me to co-write with him, and we talked about what it means to design with motion in mind. That means like figuring out what that motion is. He, he does a lot of stuff that's 3D modeling. We do a lot of stuff that's physical prototyping. But then backing into things that are more technical, like getting the algorithms, you know, doing the curve fits in, and then specking the parts. So um, we have had situations where, like I mentioned, it took us a long time to get that linear action. <laughs> like you would not believe how hard that was. Um, it just re required a lot of power and a lot more power than we could move on the turtle bot. So we had to beef up the turtle bot. So um, it, it actually takes a lot of engineering to make these things work, but we are good at engineering. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I think we have people who are initially skeptical and really annoyed at all the puppeteering. And then when we come to them with the technical problem, then they are suddenly very excited. <laughs> and, and suddenly they like what we do. So, I mean, I think that's just an interesting tension between people in the field and the different value systems they have. But we haven't, we haven't run to, into the situation yet where engineers say, like, that's physically impossible. We can't do that. Yeah. How much of the way people interact with these robots in these, uh, in these prototype studies do you think is sort of driven by the novelty I've never seen this before. This is interesting. Mm -hmm. you know, people might have fun playing with a robot, and how do you how do you see that the relation between that and how people would actually interact with you know this automated happening in their house? How much of it is this? Oh, it's fun to explore how I can interact with this robot. I've never done this before. Versus like I actually want this automated, and you know, it's convenient to bring it here and drop off my my dream. Yeah, I think a lot of this stuff is highly contextual and novelty is one big factor. I, I do think most of the stuff that we're doing right now is just looking at what that first blush interaction would be like. In the case of the uh, garbage can, aside from the initial giggles, I think you know most of your interactions will be fleeting and really ephemeral, and so these are likely to be what the relationship is like. Whereas I can imagine the relationship with the ottoman changing a lot over time. Um, there's some really wonderful research looking at how people engage with their uh, robotic vacuum cleaners, and they build these very deep relationships with these robotic vacuum cleaners. Um, and so I think that, that that's the sort of thing that we expect. Um, one wonderful thing about design is that you're always moving, you're trying to aim at a moving target. <laughs> um, so I think that there, there's a high chance that these things will evolve. I mean, I think design is like writing, where there's no one right way to do it, but many wrong ways. <laughs> um, and so, and, and also there's, there, people have different tastes. So there's some stuff that everyone can kind of agree on, it's general principles, and then there's still preferences. Um, the, well, that is one of the things I thought was really great about the engagement. Like, what I like about the engagement stuff is that every, un, everyone understands what the Ottoman is saying. But not everyone agrees about what we should do about that, you know? And I think that is okay. And I, I think that's an interesting thing to, as an interaction designer, be able to design around, you know, like the adaptation. You know, we, we're already showing how we're trying to adapt to people's moods. It would be interesting to adapt to people's like cultural preferences and things like that. Um, I, I think that's really fine. I, one of the things that is really interesting about our work is we are learning interesting things about people all of the time you know, things that social scientists knew a long time ago but didn't look at it this way, some stuff that social scientists are totally shocked to see. You know, really fun. Um, and if you like people, you know, um, this is an interesting way to go about finding out about them. Yeah. No, I mean, I know about some of the research. There's some really fun research that was done, the IBO, probably similar to the IDOC. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I love this. Um, and I think there might be interesting crossovers. I mentioned most of the research we do is non anthropomorphic, not biomorphic, um, but the, obviously the behaviors are evocative. Um, and you can see, like with the Ottoman, there was a, a strong, like, dog came up a lot, you know, <laughs> a lot. Um, 
So, you know, I think the different designers on the team have wanted to play around with whether to kind of lean into that more or not. We may or may not do more experiments in that way. Um, but I think one of the things is that I think that kind of goes back to the social status and what the social status of pets is, and it's so differential. Like some people really think like dogs are members of their family, and other people think dogs are like furry furniture. Um, so I think that's one of the things we're trying to like. We want to understand the whole concept better before we do more work in the area. Yeah. Yeah, there, we didn't have enough of any kind of person to know for sure. Um, like, like children, there are not that many children on university campuses, so we had that, like, we, when we say the kid, like, it's always that kid that you saw on the camera. We don't have, like, a large collection of kid interactions to test with. Um, one thing is I mentioned how we inadvertently had to move sites from, you can see, like, we actually went from having a system that only did camera and is, like, a really limited view to something that was, like, fancier. When we went to go back and do the fancier system, we ended up having to do that deployment in a different place. And we didn't at all think ahead of time about the fact that just across campus is a big, big cultural shift, you know? And like, you know, Huang Engineering Building versus like GSB is a big shift. So the, GSB. sorry, sorry, Graduate School of Business. So it's actually uh, largely adults who have been making a lot of money in, in the executive world and then coming back to school. So not even like normal students. <laughs> <laughs> um, and these people are too busy. You know, um, to be bothered, although they do like, when we interview, we, you know, what you can't see is like we would have people chasing down people after the interaction and interviewing them about it. They didn't like having their garbage taken away. Um, they just thought that things, anything more persistent was just irritating. Like it needed to be much more subtle and suave about the way that interacted. They wanted it to be much more deferential. Um, so whereas the engineering people thought it was fun for the trash can to be excited, like some people mentioned that it was a little bit, you know, overexcited over at the GSB. So there, there are some interesting things, but that's really the only big difference we were able to, we, we didn't have enough people of different types. And, and one thing that we really wanted to do was to get really far from Silicon Valley and try the same thing. It's really far from Silicon Valley, but in a place where they have smooth floors and good Wi-Fi coverage. <laughs> so, so we're still looking for that site. Yeah. So other than smoothing out interaction between Mm -hmm. Do you have any particular social goals in mind? Like, what is this? How is this going to improve society? Or how is this, like, do you have any bigger goals in, in mind as well? Or? You know, I think one thing is that I, I'm personally really motivated by kind of the aesthetic of interaction, and it's a little bit not about saving the world, you know, or selling product. It's it's about what how things feel, um, and and that sense of things. But I think as we move into the car work, it's been really interesting because that work is obviously a lot more impactful. Things that are, are subtle aesthetically still have like really, really serious ramifications for the, you know, life, <laughs> the lifeline of the people involved. And so that has been an interesting shift for me to move from this space where we're doing things that people thought were interesting and funny, but a little bit separated from like saving lives, making money, and other things that people care about to this thing that everyone agrees is super important. Um, so I think I'm still getting used to the that change, and I don't know how I feel about it yet, but it's been, it's been, I, I've enjoyed it so far. Yes? Say a little bit more about trust and what things you see so far that have caused people to trust objects or robots and things that are seeming to not more. Yeah, so we, we, trust is like the big thing that gets talked about, especially for automation in cars. Um, Whereas before we were really focused on engagement, but then so that is actually, it's the same team of students that I have that basically been dragged from one area to the, the other. And so we have had a lot of discussions post facto about how much do we think that people trusted or didn't trust like the drawers um, or these systems. And one thing that we felt was that people actually trust the robots that they're seeing in the scenarios where there's this kind of scripted seamless interaction much more than any of the people that were engaging in like the first person interactions with the robots. 
um, maybe because there's a novelty effect, but also because I think maybe that timing and um, I'm just going to blank on the word, but this, this thing where there's a clear back and forth and this like meeting in the minds is present. Um, one thing is where for roboticists who are looking at these videos, there's just like the, the bar for the interaction is really high, not for the actual motion stuff like that, but what you have to recognize, some of the things that are being picked up on are, are, are small. Um, and so I actually think the thing that is happening is that all of those things will actually matter. Like you, you actually need to be responding really quickly to what people are doing so to build that kind of sense that everything is smooth enough that you have that trust. Um, and it's a fun problem. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know that anybody in any of the interviews I was looking at expressed a feeling that they weren't safe or felt under physical threat. Um, yeah, but I, I do think, you know, you saw the one woman that like brought her feet up and was like this. So I, I think that that, you know, that would be kind of the extreme. She was the only person that did that, but that was like she, she didn't feel comfortable with it moving. Um, and it wasn't just the initial like, oh my gosh, it's moving, but it's like it's still coming at me. You know? um, so I mean, I think that that's interesting. We, we probably need to do some more experimentation and interviews to find out more about that. Um, you know, I'm actually surprised, not with our robots, which are based on like low-end consumer electronics, but I, I see people interacting around like these KUKA arms all the time, and I'm like, that thing can take your head off. You know, that's like really seriously dangerous, but people are like singularly unconcerned. They're much less concerned than they ought to be. And I, I actually think on the whole, people's like level of trust is like way high considering the amounts of force that are going on. I think, I think that we are also around each other physically all the time, and we are doing a lot to make that work. And you know, if you ever accidentally just like full force like walk into somebody, this actually hurts. A lot. I mean, not, most of the time we are actually modulating ourselves an incredible amount. Um, and I think that people just assume robots are going to do that, and roboticists know that's a terribly hard problem. Um, but um, you know, I would like to figure out how people can get a feeling for how how they shouldn't be so you know content about the whole thing. But my sense is people tend to be a little bit more trusting than they should be. Wonderful. This was Thank fun. And Wendy did a great job plugging two of our upcoming speakers. Uh, next Wednesday, October 15th, we'll have David Kirch speaking in the series. And then right before Thanksgiving on November 24th, uh, from Pixar, we'll have Alvin Ray Smith speaking. So stay tuned for both of those.